Welcome to Buckets. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. I'm joined by NBA futures analyst Brandon Anderson. This is the big picture. Every week on the show, we break down the hottest topics in the NBA, how those results impact our betting outlooks, and we try and get a sense for where the value can be found behind the narratives of the NBA. Brandon, how you doing, my man? Good. We are we're hitting the home stretch here. We it feels like we're getting a good sense of what these teams look like out of the trade deadline. Getting, we finally got to see Joel Embiid and James Harden play some games together. Maybe we'll play a real team before long. I'm excited. It, it, we are, you know, a week out from March Madness bracket coming. And March Madness bracket means that we are not too long from the NBA playoffs. Like we wrap that up and hit right in the NBA playoffs. And we've got NBA basketball now every single night until uh, till we get to the finals breaks in June, I guess. So we're, we're running. It's going to be even shorter this year with how the schedule works out. It's actually kind of wild that the tournament ends on like the fourth and the NBA post like regular season ends on the 10th. It's, it's going to be absolutely berserk how quickly we transition into the playoffs from March Madness. Let's start as we do every week with tip off. This is where we go over the biggest stories in the NBA. So the Memphis Grizzlies and Dallas Mavericks are absolutely kind of unstoppable at this point. John ja Morant going off for 52 and 46 in the last week. The Grizzlies just keep rolling. Meanwhile, the Dallas Mavericks get another win versus the Golden State Warriors and then versus the Los Angeles Lakers, including Luka picking on LeBron James down the stretch and switches absolutely uh, tearing apart the old man. Tough scene for LeBron as the Lakers continue to slide. But the Mavericks have been red hot. Brandon, this is what's crazy. Since January 1st, the Mavericks are 20 and 7. They were four games back. I'm sorry, they were three games back of the Memphis Grizzlies on January 1st. After going 20 and 7, they are four games back of the Memphis Grizzlies because the Memphis Grizzlies have gone 20 and 6. These are second and third best records in the NBA in the calendar year 2022. John ja Morant has put himself back into the back half of the MVP conversation. I'm not willing to say that he's a serious threat to win it despite the odds movement. Luca is getting people remembering why he was the favorite coming into the season. Uh, I will ask you this. I think it's pretty clear that Memphis is going to win the division. Their comfort zone is high enough and they've won in a high enough clip to say they're going to win the division, which whew, thank you. Uh, Cause I had a lot of money on that. Um, but I'll just say this. Who do you think is the more dangerous team going into the playoffs, the Memphis Grizzlies or the Dallas Mavericks? Ooh, that is a good question. I feel like we still have to lean Memphis right now. You know, the Grizzlies, so Memphis started nine and 10 since then 34 and 10, that is a 64 win pace. Like that is a juggernaut team that we still, that I still am not giving that amount of credit to. We're giving them a lot of credit. We're putting jaw into you know, we, we need to start talking about the MVP conversation. Can we have an MVP conversation and like an MVP ballot conversation? Yeah, they're they're two different. different conversations. And, you know, we, we know that, but we all do it. Like, uh, Luca, is Luca going to be in the MVP conversation? No. no Luca, Luca can get onto the ballot. Luca is going to get some fifth or fourth place votes yeah. and deserve them. He's not in the MVP conversation. There are three names. Jaw has been awesome. He's going to win most improved. We had Grizzlies both. I think all three of us, Raheem, I think had two Grizzlies for the division. Yeah, I've been watching it closely because, man, Dallas just keeps not losing. Yeah. And I keep waiting, like, do, do, do we need to hedge? Do, do I have to put a little money on Dallas? It's, they can't close the gap because Memphis won't lose. So, yeah, I, I do feel like the division odds are, are – you know, Dallas's odds are long, but they, they need to be at this point. There's too far back, and Memphis is playing so well. In the playoff setting, I'm a little leery of both of these teams. Dallas, it's it's still a, too much of a one-man show, and it's a pretty good one-man, but I don't know if I trust one person to beat entire playoff teams that are good. With Memphis, I still have a little oh, concern that maybe this is a regular season juggernaut. The depth is such a big factor. The, the winning the possession battle is a big factor. I'm a little leery of both of these teams. I'm still not there yet on one of them making a deep, serious run, but I know that you are more interested. At, do you see either of these teams getting a real shot at the finals? 
I mean, I think they can make the Western Conference Finals. I don't see them beating Phoenix, and I don't see them beating whoever comes out of like the other the other kind of threats. I think are more serious, whether it's Golden State or if there's an upset. But look, would it be insane? No, like you know, the Suns roll through the first two rounds, and then Chris Paul gets hurt, and then Dallas finds themselves in that matchup, and they're there. That doesn't that wouldn't shock me. What I will say is. It's going to be interesting to see what Dallas does here down the stretch because they're looking like they're going to be in the four or five Utah Phoenix matchup. Um, Utah got the stops on them over the weekend. That's one of the few losses that they've had over the last couple of weeks. That was a over on Friday night. I was, that was on the NBA bet stream. That matchup I think is very tough for them, but there's also a lot of reasons to think that Dallas over the course of the series, if Jason Kidd can figure out the right adjustments, boy, that's a big, if could wind up causing a lot of problems for them. Phoenix, I can't see them beating. I do not see Phoenix, yeah. the Dallas having what it takes to beat Phoenix, but it's hard to see anybody having what it takes to beat Phoenix outside of Golden State. So it'll be interesting to see if it get, comes down late in the season and Denver and Dallas are jockeying for five, what decisions those teams make and who tries to move into six if they don't have to worry about falling to seven, depending on what the Timberwolves do. We're too far out right now. You just got to keep winning to make sure you don't fall in the play-in. But those teams, I think, are very interesting. Memphis is also particularly interesting. They went 3-0 and versus Denver this season. I don't love the matchup for them, but they did go 3-0. and If they get past Denver in a 3-6 or versus the Wolves in a 2-7, because Memphis is now a real threat to win the two seed, Memphis, I think, is live versus Golden State. Like I like the matchup path for Memphis more than I like Dallas because there's no chance of Memphis facing Phoenix until the conference finals. They're going to be two or three. And though, from that perspective, if you're betting on one of those two teams – I do like, I think the chances of the Grizzlies are a little bit better. I will say, if you're looking to bet these two teams and you want to ride the hot hands or these upstart teams or whatever, you can get Southwest Division title odds to win the division and you can get them at a pretty healthy plus number. I bet that was plus 700 a couple weeks ago. So uh, interesting kind of angle to take there. Yeah, so I have I have one, I try to think of like, what's the big question that I have on these teams? I don't know if this is the big question, but let me ask a question, one for each team here of just the thing that's holding me back a little bit. So start with Dallas. Since the Porzingis trade, Luca, Luca is putting up 35, 11, and 7. He's not the question. Spoiler alert. He's, he's the answer. He's averaging four threes a game during that period, 39%. Like we know that he is amazing. He's playing right now. If you just took the last few weeks, he's playing at that MVP level equal to those other guys. Whole season counts though. Here's my question on Dallas. We've talked about it before. How much do we buy this defense showing up in the playoffs? They, the Mavericks allowed the least three pointers in the league. They're third and fewest threes allowed, but fourth in three point percentage allowed, which we know the percentage is not a sticky number. I worry a little bit that there's a little, uh, little Knicks regression coming in here, perhaps on that three point percentage. Um, we're recording this on Thursday. They're playing the Warriors tonight. I noticed today the Mavericks are the number one defense against point guards. I don't look at the Mavericks and see, oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah, the Mavericks, they're shutting point <laughs> guards down. That makes sense to me. Like, what what, what are you seeing in, like, the X's and O's here? And is do you have confidence in the Dallas defense? You know, they layer a lot. They play really sound defense. Um, they are – they're physical on the interior with Maxi Kleba and Dwight Powell. It's surprising because those guys are a little undersized, but they just play really physical. And that's been a, a huge benefit to them. You still got guys like DFS that can challenge on the perimeter. The bench does a good enough job. You know, you look at what are they doing? So they allow this season, the Mavericks are giving up the seventh lowest effective field goal percentage. Okay based off of opponent expected shot quality, which is this is actually adjusted for the specific players and what those those players should shoot from the spots that the Mavs allow them to. So this is more contextual than just overall league averages. This one adjusted for that via second spectrum. Um, the Mavericks don't actually aren't having that good of luck. The Boston Celtics are number one in that category by a, a healthy margin. The Cavs are second, the Clippers are third, the Suns are fourth. Those are all really good defenses. But the Mavs are actually 13th in that category, allowing them about 0.75% worse than expected. What is interesting about that is if you look at, at that from that perspective, Dallas really is doing a great job. They have the seventh lowest expected field goal percentage. So they are not allowing great looks and forcing a low percentage. That's where you get concerned. 
the Mavs are allowing a low expected percentage and a slightly worse percentage. And that's how they've gotten their defense to be as good as it has been. They're switching more since Porzingis left. That's been a, a big change for them. I still look at Dimwitty and Bertans and wonder how that's going to hold up. I agree with you. The, the personnel doesn't necessarily translate. I worry about Utah and, and how big of an advantage on the boards they're going to have. A lot of teams are going to have rebounding advantages, but I do think Dallas is probably a little bit more legit defensively this season. I'm not sure how it's going to carry forward. I'm not expecting it. I'm not like itching to bet against them. Let's move on and let's talk about the Miami Heat, who, boy, Tough, tough loss for them last night versus those Bucks. They lead, you know, they, they go down big early. They come back. They take the lead. They lead for most of the game. They've got it in hand, and they just absolutely melt apart. Jimmy Butler did not score for, like, the or did not hit a field goal for, like, the last, like, 38 minutes of the game. Absolutely wild. But Tyler Hero put them in really great position. But then they had a series of comical errors down the stretch, and Drew Holiday finishes the uh, a tough bucket off of a questionable call to get the Bucs the win over Miami. They split season series. No Kyle Lowry, though, who continues to be out with a personal issue. It's assumed he'll be back for the playoffs. No reason to think he won't be. Brooke Lopez is practicing. My big question for you here, Brandon, is this. I like the matchup for Miami versus Milwaukee. Last night did not dissuade me from that. I do think the big question is going to be if Brooke Lopez is back and Kyle Lowry's playing, I'm going to bet the Heat on the win line. So if they're plus two and a half or plus one and a half, I'm going to bet them on the win line. If broke Lopez is out, I'm going to bet the heat straight up to win the series. What is your take um, on the importance of Lowry versus Lopez in this matchup? That's interesting. Lopez. We, we've talked a lot about Lopez. Definitely. We, the, the box need him back, but in my opinion and the way I've been framing in my head is they need a Lopez back because of Joel Embiid. I haven't necessarily thought about him as a swing player in a series like this, but I get it just because what I noticed from this game last night is a distinct, distinct advantage for Miami's bench against Milwaukee's bench. And obviously Tyler Hero had a monster game. I'm not even necessarily counting that as the big reason. Hero had 30 points, six threes. He's going to do that some games, but look at the Bucks bench from the game last night. We got a lot, a lot of Wes Matthews and Serge Ibaka. It's feeling very Lakersy when you're rolling out Ibaka and Matthews, yeah. like in the year of our Lord 2022, when these guys are your top two bench guys. Yeah. Your next two bench guys are Javon Carter and DeAndre Bembry, who remember both got cut by the Nets, who have no players. They were they played 23 minutes combined last night, so. Miami's bench, we, we thought it was a question mark coming into the year. And then Miami did what Miami always does. They suddenly have Max Struess and they, they suddenly have Yurtz event. And just, these guys, they're just coming up with gems and rolling them out there. We know, too, that they're about to get older Victor, older Vic, uh, Victor, Victor Oladipo. Oladipo. That's the one. They're about to get him back. We don't know what that will look like, but it, it can't hurt. Heat culture, like we believe at this point. So... The bench is an issue. Lopez can at least help that by letting Bobby Portis cook a little bit better from the bench. To me, Kyle Lowry and Brooke Lopez is a different, entirely different level of player conversation. I need the heat to have Kyle Lowry to really take them seriously as a playoff team. I know, I know they made the finals without Kyle Lowry two years ago. This is a different year. It's a different era. You're right. The matchup here is really interesting. We saw it. We saw it each of the last two years. And it was a very polarizing result each time. I hope we get it. You know, it, it's a, it'll be a fun playoff series. It's a fun game last night. Um, did, did you, from this game, was this more, did the Heat lose this game or did the Bucks win it? I think the Heat lost it. Honestly, I think that they, given how they play, they had a lot of opportunities. Jimmy Butler plays a little bit. Now, this is part of the risk with Butler is he follows up great games with like, eh. Like he's just not reliable. He's he, Jimmy Butler is not the guy that you're going to get 25 and five from every night. He's just not, that's not who he's been. That's not who he's going to be. He'll give you 40 one night. He'll give you 13 the next. You just do not know what you're going to get with Jimmy buckets. You just don't know. You just do not know what you're going to get from Butler. And I think that's a concern, but when you have the amount of talent they have and the way that they can match up, I still think that they're extremely dangerous. One thing on the bench, I will say before we move on is um, look, I think the, the rotation for the bucks is going to be short. It's going to be Middleton, Giannis, Portis, uh, let's put Brooke back in. That's four. Drew, that's five. 
uh, Grayson Allen, that's six. Pat Connaughton comes back, that's seven. And then sure. like one of Wes Matthews, Serge Ibaka, um, DeAndre Bembry, Jordan Nwora. Right, that's about as much as you're going to get. Uh, yeah. They're going to play a shorter rotation. Bud learned last year about they just got to play a shorter rotation. That's just where the team is at. They just do not have the depth. So um, I'm not as worried about the bench. Just the Miami's bench is a, is definitely a luxury and it's something they, they can use, but I don't think you have to have it in the playoffs. And I think Milwaukee is a good example of a team that can play shorter as the series goes longer. Meanwhile, on the other end of two teams that have played really well lately in the Bucks and the Heat, you have the Golden State Warriors who, boy, this team – quite quite the the slippage from from the old old warriors in this one uh, you know clay thompson's been out along with draymond green andre godal has been out but they lose 114 129 to the timberwolves uh they lose the mavericks over the weekend in a, in a staggering collapse on saturday night the warriors have really been struggling like this team has simply not been great and now all of a sudden after a pretty comfortable lead the Warriors are just one game up on the Grizzlies for the two seed. They are four and six in their last 10. The Warriors are, they've lost two in a row. And that leads us into the big picture. The big picture this week is about the golden state Blariers. See, so instead of warriors, I said, blah, or I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think that works, but it's about the Warriors. And we're going to talk about this. Um, you know, I had Steph Curry, two players that we honed in on in preseason for MVP were Steph Curry and Giannis Compo. If you had told me back in August, Brandon, that Steph Curry, that the Warriors were going to be the two seed, I would have been like, my Steph future soon come. Yes. Like if you told me the Nets were the seventh seed or the eighth seed rather, and that the, the Bucks were the fifth seed and the Warriors were the two, I'd be like, I am, I'm cashing that baby. Yes, let's go. I feel so smart. And yet here, here we are with Curry yeah. going on three straight months of pretty uneven, uninspired play. His, his shooting, I think is hilarious in that this is like categorically not a great year for Steph Curry shooting. Like this is just not by his standards, a good season for Steph shooting standards um, under no circumstances. Is it good by Steph standards? Yeah. Steph still leads the field for three point percentage amongst all of candidates. It's Curry at 37.5% and then Embiid at 37%. And then like John Morant's at 34%. Giannis is at, th- at 30%. Like there's nobody that's really in the conversation because Kevin Durant got hurt. Um, that's up there with him. You, my friend are a warrior's believer. You have been a warrior's believer. You have been a warrior's backer. You have been on this train one, what do you like? We know Steph Curry's MVP odds are dead, so RIP to those. Um, what do you think has been the deal with Steph Curry? And tell me why, because you continue to not be worried about it over the course of the season. It's been a while now. I expected the turn to have come sooner than lately. Yeah, I really thought the turn had come heading into the break. the The shooting numbers had bounced back positively pretty well. Like. I think over maybe a 13 or 14 game stretch, he was at 39 or 40%. Just, you know, for any mortal human, an awesome stretch considering the sort of volume that he has. And then now coming out of the break, you know, that of course he had 16 threes at the all-star game. And I wondered as that was happening, okay, is this it? Is Is this going to officially break him out? I know it's just an exhibition, but the confidence in the moment and everything. But then... Is interesting. The the cold stretch for Curry, when did it start? It started at the Ray Allen three-point push. It started in that Portland game when I bet actual real human money <laughs> on Steph Curry to, to put up what, like 15 threes in a game? Yeah. And genuinely believed he might do it because he's that good. And it turns out he also believed he would do it and got up a ton of shots and was forcing it. And it didn't work. At the end of the All-Star game, I know it's just an All-Star game. Curry wanted the record. He wanted that points record. He wanted that other three. And you started to get some of those kind of forced jacking up threes. And I kind of had that feeling of like, uh-oh, this feels a lot like what we saw earlier. And now out of the break, he's had three really bad shooting games and right back into that cold stretch again. Maybe it's nothing. It probably is nothing. It's just the All-Star game. But it really felt like he was breaking out of it a little bit and and his back in where I'm at though. Big picture is this. 
this is not about Steph Curry to me. It's some about Steph Curry. Steph is not going to make 80% of his threes every time you want him to forever. And he did that for, for a while this season. He really did. And it was awesome. This is about Draymond Green. And, and I think it's a, it's a reminder and a referendum on one-man teams in the NBA. This is not a one-man team. There are more players than just Steph, Draymond, and Clay. But the more players are not guys that we had the highest of opinions on coming to the season. Like this, this is a team that Steph and Draymond elevated these other guys, Gary Payton and Kuminga, the rookie, uh, Juan Toscano Anderson, like these guys have been valiant. They've been great for them, but they're great in the team context with Draymond on the court this season. The Warriors are 28 and six. That is a 68 win pace. That's the Warriors. As we knew them, that's the title favorite. As we see them 28 wins, 19 by double digits over two thirds of them without Draymond green, 15 and 13, basically 500. They've only had half of those wins by double digits. They had six losses by double digits, only one with Draymond. That's it. There's no Draymond. There's no Warriors. We're back to the Warriors who are the Timberwolves. Or, you know, like they're, they're a 500 team that is just good enough. Like, look, look around the rest of the league. What are we seeing this year? We're seeing the Bucks, like you said, as the five seed with an MVP, but not enough other help that stayed healthy. So they're not up at the top of the race. We're seeing the Lakers. We're seeing the Nets missing out on the main postseason right now because their guys aren't healthy and a one-man show and can't get it done. Jokic with certainly has even less help than Steph has had and can't get up into that top echelon. The Warriors got half of a really good season, and now they have half of a oops, just like the other teams with superstar season. I think that's what we're seeing. So I can't get worried until I know that Draymond is definitely – done for this year so at FanDuel the Warriors seating line over two and a half minus 150 they're now favored to finish third under two and a half plus 115 so if you think that they're going to stabilize you get plus money on it the Grizzlies over two and a half is minus 120 under is minus 110. I don't know how that works considering there's, these are the only two teams that can realistically <laughs> catch one another, but that's how that, where those numbers are at. Uh, let me ask you this. Does the two versus the three seed, does this change anything in your estimation for the Warriors title run? So I was going to say no. And then I thought more about it and I think yes, but not necessarily for the reason you think we think automatically two or three seed. Okay. Well, Memphis gets the two seed. Now you get game seven in Memphis for that second round series. Yeah, that matters. That would matter more for Memphis than I think that it would hurt Golden State. The Warriors can go on the road. Steph, Draymond, Clay, like they'll be fine. But it matters a lot to the young Memphis team to get the game at home. But you might not get to game seven. And getting the two seed might mean that the Warriors get game six at home. That's bad. So it could go either way on that one. Here's where it does matter, though. You're the two seed right now it looked very likely that the Lakers are going to be locked out of the seven or eight, that they're the nine plus seed. That means the Lakers can't be the seven, right? The only seven seed can be the seven or eight. That is Clippers or Timberwolves. You're the three seed. You're probably playing the Mavs or the Nuggets. That is a mega difference in a first round matchup. Yeah. Like that is a walkover first round series personally. And unless suddenly Clippers get healthy. Yeah versus a genuine test in the first round and a test of attrition. We know how that goes. And we're a team with, you know, when Draymond has the back injury and Steph doesn't hold up well over the playoffs always, you don't want, you want the easy first round. You want the, not, it's not a buy. You got to still go out and beat the Wolves or the Clippers. You don't want to play the Nuggets or you don't want to play the Mavs. You don't want Jokic or Luka winning two games on their own. And suddenly you got a must win game six in the first round. That's the difference I think that matters where I'm not sure that they will really, really care about the two seed, but I think that's the reason that they maybe ought to. Grizzlies went four now versus the Clippers. They are two and two versus the Wolves after the loss uh, last week in that matchup. I haven't dug enough in to, to know like who gets the edge in, in those types of matchups. I do know that if it's Golden State in the two, I feel very confident with Draymond in their ability to beat the Clippers or wolves i think the grizzlies it becomes more of a like oh boy hope hope they don't lose one of the first two at home because that could get a little awkward like if the clippers even without Kawhi and pg if they win the first one of the first two that's going to get tense in a hurry 
Like it's just going to get that, that series will get very, very real. Um, and that may be honestly the way I'm going to play the Grizzlies. That might be just be taken, even when they're big favorites, take the other team on the win line. You know, I like doing that plus two and a half and trust that they're going to be able to force this into being a longer series. I don't see Memphis rolling through these teams. They're too inexperienced. They're too young. They're too fast break oriented. There's a lot of reasons to think that there's going to be, be enough opportunities, um, for those teams to hang in that series. I won't feel great about it if the Clippers don't have either PG or Kawhi back, but that may have to be the decision. We'll talk about that as we get closer to the playoffs. I'm just mad. Man, I had Draymond for freaking DPOY, yeah. and that's gonna not going to cash, and Steph yeah. for MVP, and it's just... Yeah, Dr- Draymond was long, too. We had Draymond at, I think, 33 to 1, and we gave that on the podcast, and I've got that. I have multiple hits on that, and boy, we were cash money on that. Like, the Steph MVP looked very good early. Draymond DPOI was done. That was done. Like it was over. All he had to do was play 15 more games and not have this exact thing happen to him. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm frustrated as, as an NBA historian. Also, I'm frustrated that we got this season from the Warriors for half of the year. And like, I, I truly, I, this stuff matters. Draymond to get that second defensive player of the year Steph to have that one last MVP yeah. or, or right in the mix. Like that stuff yeah. really matters for historical standing. And they were that good this year. They're just not going to get their injuries, which that part matters. You, you got to play the games. Well, but I, I'm bummed this. for them. Also the Steph's could still could have won MVP. If he could hit a freaking shot that, that that's one thing that, that would have happened if he could hit. It's very weird. that Steph Curry is struggling to shoot the ball. I don't understand that. How <laughs> am I losing a Steph Curry MVP bat because of shooting? How, how is that a thing that has happened uh, in my life? All right, let's go ahead and wrap up with Back to the Future. This is where we talk about our favorite futures that we have in our pocket. Brandon, I'll let you go first. What's your Back to the Future play of the week? So I'm going back to the heat on this one. Uh, DraftKings right now has a lot of team over-unders up. These obviously are not the over-unders we started with before the season. Some of those are already done and dusted. You got new lines. These lines even are moving day by day. So this one switched since yesterday. The Heat right now are at a line of 53.5 wins. I'm taking the under at plus 105, so slight plus odds here. Miami is 41 and 22. They have 19 games left. That means to get to over, the Heat have to go 14 and 5. I think the Heat can absolutely go 14 and 5. They're mostly healthy. Hopefully Lowry comes back. We know Oladipo is going to play. I just don't think they need to get to 55. And I'm not sure that they're going to need to push that hard to get there. They're up a couple on the bulls. They got the tie break. They, I don't know, are going to necessarily get the huge push from Philly or Milwaukee. We'll see Butler and bam, they, they need the rest. Like this has been a tough Miami season. If they could get those guys a couple extra days, a couple extra games off down the stretch, that's big for this Miami team. So I'm not sure they need to push that hard to get to the one seed. I think they will get the one seed. I still know they need to get 14 wins to get there. Their last five games, Chicago, Toronto, Charlotte, Atlanta, Orlando. Now those are not great opponents necessarily, but Chicago, Toronto, Charlotte, Atlanta, those are four teams that are going to need wins. They're going to care those games. They're going to want to play for those games. The Magic will not. But that's the finale. The Magic might have already clinched their tanking spot and might end up accidentally trying that game. Those are games that we know the opponent will try. I think those are pretty losable games for the Heat if they're not really up for it, just kind of waiting for the playoffs. So Heat under plus 105. I don't hate it. They're uh, they're probably, it looks like they're going to rest guys. We're recording this on Thursday. It looks like they might rest them tonight versus the Nets. We'll see, but they're going to be more in mind with getting guys healthy than playoff seedings. That's one team I know will not gun for the number one seed. If they get there, great, but this team will feel confident about going on the road in the playoff series. And they're not going to worry about matchups. They'll just be like, come what may. Uh, for mine, uh, I am going back to the well on the good old reliable four-way awards parlay. Yes. Evan Mobley minus 550, John Morant minus nine. I'm sorry, Evan Mobley minus 550 to win rookie of the year, John Morant minus 900 to win most improved, Tyler Eero minus 3,500 to win sixth man of the year, and then I'm throwing Joel Embiid minus 125 to win MVP. That pays out 
plus 143. Look, I get that there's a lot of things that that he feels like could happen. Evan Mobley has one rookie of the year. It's done. It's over. Scotty Barnes can do whatever he wants. Kate Cunningham can do whatever he wants. And they're not going to catch him. Evan is part of a winning team. He has been phenomenal this year. He might honestly be the rightful DPOY winner, even though I don't think he'll win it. Um, I'm probably going to make the case for him that he should win DPOY, knowing that he's not going to. He's been that good defensively and that much of an impact player. Jaw's going to win most improved. There's a reason these guys are the big favorites. Tyler's going to average the most points. That's all of it. It's done. Like, that's it. So those three are locked. With Embiid, Jokic has tailed off the last about 10 days, and it's look, there's a lot of reasons to kind of think maybe he's just mentally tired or just like whatever, and he could have these big games. Uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I think there's an, a possibility that, that Nikola Jokic doesn't want to win MVP. I think it's I think it's possible. I, I'm not putting it past Jokic not to, to not want to win. Um, I don't think the bonus for him means that much to him, and it requires a lot of media attention that he hates. I don't think he minds not being asked about it if he were to slip out of the conversation. Joel Embiid, on the other hand, very much wants to win it. The Sixers are destroying absolutely everybody. And in the March 14th matchup, the Sixers are obviously going to be a heavy favorite. Embiid likely wins that. Embiid likely has a big game. I'm trying to get ahead of that point. That March 14th matchup between the Nuggets and Sixers, I think, is a turning point. I think Embiid wins. I think Embiid has a monster showing. And I think Embiid wins MVP based off of the strength of that. So still getting him at minus 25, but putting it with these other three. And there's a couple of books you can do this at. DraftKings is another. You can put these, you can parlay these awards and that gets you to a pretty healthy plus number. There is nobody else I can see winning most improved. There's nobody else I can see winning rookie of the year. There's nobody else I can see winning six man. So we're going to put those together and make Joel into essentially transitioning him from a minus 125 to a plus 143. Yeah, I I, I like the idea. I We've done MVP a lot. We just did MVP right before this on Twitter spaces. You can check that out. The recording is there. We'll do plenty more MVP. I'm not there in the MVP on the MB part of the MVP conversation, but I get it. I understand the spot. I love the rest of it. I love putting jaw and Mobley and hero. I, I've been doing that with all sorts of futures for the last couple of weeks now is stack those up. The odds are slipping away. Like you got to do it now yeah. because yeah. jaw, I think has gone from about minus 450 to minus 900 just in the last week while he's had, I think his three highest scoring games of the season. So that'll do it he's going to win. These, these guys are going to win. It's done. Like their MVP. Here's, here's why MVP is not done. MVP is not done. Number one, because there are two other really, really good deserving candidates that can also win it. That's not the case in any of these other awards. Yep. Number two, it just matters more for MVP. And so we care about games played and injuries and all that kind of stuff. We don't care that much about that for most improved. Correct. If Jaw suddenly missed the last three weeks, who cares? He's still the most improved player. It's done. Like if, if that happens to the MVP and then your team falls in the standings and blah, 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 the seating, that stuff all matters there. Those races are done. So you can still basically pile those three on and, and get essentially like a, a 40 or 50% profit boost to whatever it is that you're doing. It's dropping though. The, the, the odds are dropping there. So you've got to get those there. But I, I like the stack idea. I've been doing that a lot. Let's wrap it up for buckets. Make sure you guys have yourselves a great week. I'll be back on Monday with a fantasy episode with my guy, Dan Titus. Make sure to check out everything on the Action Network app. It's the best way for you to track your scores, get up to the second information on where the bets and money are coming in and follow Brandon's picks in there as well. Check out all that on the Action Network app. Check out actionnetwork.com. Follow Action Network HQ on Twitter. Give us those five-star reviews. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you guys again next week on another edition of this podcast. Let's get buckets.